Hi and welcome to Boston Media Theory. I'm Marcus Breen. This is a program where we talk about the impact of media studies, if you like, and communication studies and cultural studies in and around the world of Boston. Well, it's not really a world, is it? It's a city. And we think about and talk with activists, researchers, academics, consultants, people who are engaged in the world of media and thinking about it through the lens of theory and through the lens of practice. And so I'm delighted to welcome Jackie Wang to the show today. Uh, welcome Jackie. Thank you. Uh, Jackie's from Harvard where she's been completing a PhD. But more importantly, I think for my purposes, uh, she's the author of this book, uh, Carceral Capitalism. It's uh, published by Semiotext last year, 2018. And I was drawn to uh, the book and to Jackie's presence in Boston through my fellow Australian, Ken Walk, at the mm -hmm. New School in New York. And uh, Ken talked about the kind of active ethnography that Jackie deployed in writing the book and the way that you talked about having a home but not being at home. Mm -hmm. That's how Ken framed it. And Ken or Mackenzie then sort of went on to suggest that this, this sort of sense of homelessness, the sense of alienation from your own home, the United States, uh, provides the foundation for a deep critique, let's say, of the country, especially its treatment of minorities, uh, but also uh, the overall or the overarching way that contemporary capitalism dehumanises mm -hmm. a very large number of people, mm -hmm. if not everybody except the people who own the capital. Right. And so what I wanted to do uh, using that as a foundation is to uh, start with uh, some thoughts about uh, how this project emerged and do that by inviting you, Jackie, to read the first part of this beautifully written book, uh, which is the introduction, and that'll give uh, all our w viewers an opportunity to get a sense of uh, what it's on, what you're on about, and, yeah. uh, and give us also a starting point. Great, thank you, and thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so I wrote this very long introduction, but I'll just read the first paragraph. <coughs> but what I was trying to do in the introduction is to situate um, my thinking and to give the reader footholds in order to make the more dense and theoretical parts of the book approachable. I really wanted to let the reader in on what I was thinking about and what were the material conditions shaping my thinking around um, the issues of prisons and police. So this is from the introduction. This project began before it began more than five years ago when I wrote an essay titled Against Innocence. That was before the Black Lives Matter movement, during a time when taking an anti-police position was often considered, a, considered scandalous, even in some leftist circles. It was a period of frenetic political activity and thinking, inspired by the movement of the squares, by Occupy Wall Street and the global wave of revolt. Many of us partook in intense collective experiments with each other. By cooking and sharing food, starting art and mental health collectives, supporting prisoners, starting queer and POC intentional communities, bootlegging and circulating inspiring essays, occupying buildings and public spaces, politicizing our understanding of friendship and engaging in other cooperative activities. We suffuse desire into our practices and move politics beyond the compartmentalized realm of organizing and into our daily lives. These were political experiments, yes, but also experiments in creating new modes and rhythms of being and material social networks rooted in the reproduction of everyday life. Wonderful. Thank you, Jackie. The final phrase there takes us to an important point, uh, if you like, within the larger field of media and communication, that is, of course, culture. 
mm -hmm. and what we might think of as cultural studies, which has been a project that's, if you like, collapsed into mm -hmm. media and communication mm -hmm. and certainly has been a tool for enriching both media studies and communication studies, mm -hmm. partly drawing on the rich traditions that emerged in the late 40s, 50s and 60s through mm -hmm. Raymond Williams and other folk. Right. and then through Stuart Hall and the Birmingham School for Cultural and Social Research. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether or not um, you'd agree that once we engage with a, with a serious and committed study of everyday life, we just can't continue to do the kind of theoretical work that we might otherwise do. Huh. Do you mean like... Um when we attend to the quotidian, we're like removed from the theoretical realm or? Yes, I think that'd be a nice way of thinking of it, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think um, they're necessarily mutually exclusive. I mean, this is part of, it's interesting you use the word ethnography because I've thought of some of the work that I do in the book as autoethnography. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which um, I'm analyzing my personal experiences, so particularly the experience of having a sibling who's incarcerated, my older brother who was given um, a juvenile life without parole sentence in Florida. And so um, in the book, I present um, many theoretical essays, um, and some of them even talk about, you know, like the biopolitics of juvenile delinquency. But I also want to let readers in on um, what is motivating and animating me when I'm doing this kind of social and political theory. Um, so I really had to attend to the everyday and the experiential um, realm in order to kind of clarify the stakes of what I was talking about. So it's really tempting to just kind of, you know, take this aerial view of mass incarceration, look at the numbers, look at the statistics, um, analyze it in a very structural way. Um, and I am very like structural and material in my analysis. Um, but that tends to um, turn these issues into an abstraction. Mm. And so in order to kind of be connected with um, the kind of on the ground impact that these systems are having on people, it was necessary for me to attend to the everyday realm. Um, and so I um, kind of included these autobiographical um, meditations in the book um, as a way to ventilate the text, um, to connect um, readers to a, you know, real lived experience. Right. Indeed, a much uh, larger experience than the individual mm -hmm. and it seems to me that one of the important contributions that the kind of work that you do, do makes is to, is to really make a bridge between what you call this autoethnography, a story of yourself and your own experience, but make the point very clearly that that's not the be all and end all. Right, yeah. That uh, a radical position actually is to, it would seem to me, and this is the position that maybe you, you would say would be a preferred position to see some sort of popular or general mobilization as a result of creating the bridge mm -hmm. to a larger right. community. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not always the, the case. I mean, there's a very strong tendency, pressure even within academia to just talk about oneself. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and to celebrate oneself. Right. Maybe that moment is, is coming to an end. Uh -huh. And maybe, maybe some of your work uh, is making a, makes a significant contribution yeah. to that, uh, the idea of celebrating the individual. But of course, what you're doing is, is, is also taking a, a, a very personal, head-on approach to the nature of contemporary capitalism mm -hmm. and how that defines and describes our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, I was wondering what, what or how you would, would help us understand the concept that you present here of racial capitalism mm -hmm. and how race has been made part and parcel mm -hmm. of contemporary capitalism, particularly in the United States. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see myself as part of this like new wave of scholars who are trying to theorize and think about what racial capitalism is conceptually. 
So the term um, was popularized by Cedric Robinson, who wrote Black Marxism. And the way that he um, articulated or defined racial capitalism was a particular analysis of capitalism emerging out of European feudalism and reinscribing the racialist thinking um, of European society. So he's really trying to um, push back against this idea that capitalism was this great equalizer and that everyone who was folded in to capitalism became this abstract category of worker. And he um, you know, writes about how people were folded in not on equal terms. Um, and so this is something that I found really useful in thinking about debates about racism, anti-blackness in the US, and capitalism. Um, I know, uh, you know a lot of friends who have been in Marxist and socialist groups, and there's this sometimes this tendency to take this orthodox line, and I, I actually don't think it's Marxist orthodoxy. I think it's kind of sloppy Marxism, but to, um, to treat um, racism as something that can be explained by class exclusively. Um, and people who um, are trying to you know, think in a more nuanced way about racism and how it, it functions know that it's not reducible to class. And so what I was trying to do was um, take you know, this analysis of racial capitalism and, and try to update it for the contemporary context. So a lot of the scholarship on racial capitalism and the um, historians and political and social theorists that are um, animated by this theory, um, they tend to focus on, I would say, the 19th century. Um, mostly, especially the historians are kind of looking at um, how um, slavery and in particularly the cotton growing south of the U.S. was embedded in these global markets. So the cotton that was being produced um, was being shipped to the U.K. for production in the textile industry. So it doesn't really make sense to treat slavery um, as something that precedes capitalism. When we think about um, the connection between capitalism and slavery, I mean, they emerge alongside each other. Um, and so they're really trying to understand um, capitalism as it emerges um, and takes off in the world. Um, but I was trying to think more about the debt economy, um, because as a millennial, you know, debt is something that structures our lives in a pretty profound way. Mm -hmm. And the way in which people are folded into the debt economy is not on equal terms either. So something that I was thinking about um, uh, in especially the introduction of my book was um, predatory loan instruments that only exist in like poor urban areas where there's concentrated poverty and segregation. And so you see things like payday loans and rent-to-own scams and other um, kind of credit instruments that ensnare people in a cycle of debt. And so I was trying to understand both the predatory nature of the debt economy and the way in which it's racialized, um, but also um, parasitic governance, so the way in which the um, government and particularly states and municipalities that are fiscally distressed um, extract from poor people of color in order to um, keep governments in operation. Which is a pretty big task. It's yeah. a big task, but I think you've done it uh, wonderfully well in, in the book. And I think the, the, the change uh, in thinking about these connections between what might be uh, what you call sloppy Marxism or vulgar, mm -hmm. vulgarish, sort of class-focused, even class-fetishized analysis, and then the, the challenge that race presents to that mm -hmm. in a country like the United States with, mm -hmm. a, with a sort of hyper-capitalist, right. fast-moving, uh, take-no-prisoners kind of uh, context uh, means that, that one has to be able to be very nimble. Mm -hmm which seems to me to be part of what you're suggesting is this new form of scholarship as well. Mm -hmm. Nimble in the sense in which one looks at a number of different uh, fields mm -hmm. simultaneously, 
mm -hmm. and then uh, critiques each of them with with the same level of energy mm -hmm. and uh, and commitment mm -hmm. uh, to a collective outcome. And I was interested uh, because I, uh, during the uh, Christmas New Year break, I went to the Equal Justice Institute in in um, Montgomery, mm -hmm. Alabama, uh, set up by Brian Stevenson, and this uh, sort of question of uh, how a strong, maybe that's too male a word, but how a position of a really uh, powerful opposition and resistance uh, is now public, mm -hmm. is, is very clearly uh, of the moment. Mm -hmm. And it seemed that, that this book and, and the institution and the memorial to folk who were lynched, mm -hmm. for over 4,000 of them, and the, the history of the connection between lynching and mass incarceration mm -hmm. that, yes. that Brian Stevenson makes uh, is quite shocking. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm saying that as a white male mm -hmm. who is on the you know, progressive side of the spectrum, walking into a museum mm -hmm. to see something that says mass incarceration is a continuation mm -hmm. of a lynching culture. Right. Yeah. That this is this is a shift. Would mm -hmm. you agree that there's something yeah. going on in public? Yeah, I definitely think so. And I'm even thinking um, there's a a map that um, I'm not sure who made the map, but it. Um, shows the direct links between ly lynching and mass incarceration by showing how um, in the areas where the most people were lynched you have the highest rates of incarceration. So there are all these ways that you can actually um, trace the connection. And so this is something that I've, I've thought about quite a lot because I, I have taught and um, TA'd um, for classes on incarceration. So last semester I was a TA for a class on mass incarceration in historical perspective, mm. where we start with slavery, studying slavery, and we look at how when slavery was abolished, there all across the South, um, black codes were implemented to criminalize black mobility in particular, like vagrancy laws and um, different um, like laws against like stealing pigs and things like that. Um, and what you s have seen historically happen in the U.S. is every time there's mobilization for black freedom and there are some political gains that are made that there's often a backlash and um, the character that that backlash takes is often um, punitive and it's often using the criminal justice system to try to roll back um, the gains of various black freedom struggles. And so, um, and I've studied a little bit um, how, um, especially in the South, like when slavery was abolished, you see the emergence of plantation prisons, um, you see the emergence of the convict lease system, and a lot of people, um, you know, have focused on how the 13th Amendment actually enshrines um, what people are now calling prison slavery. Um, but as a historian, it's really interesting to see how historians are relating to this discourse and particularly activist discourse linking slavery and incarceration because some historians think that, well, this is um, a little bit too reductive and we need to be more nuanced in our analysis and um, calling them the same thing erases the ways in which these systems are different. But for me, it's also important to pay attention to not only the vernacular language of activists, but also how prisoners are trying to understand their situation as they do things like strike. Um, so, you know, last fall, starting in August, there was a, a wave of prison strikes, and it was really centered around defining the movement as a movement to end prison slavery. Mm. And so they were um, specifically drawing on the history of slave slavery and its legacy as a way to understand their experience working for basically nothing in prison. And so, um, yeah, sometimes I'm like, okay, I got to like, I don't know, not just be a, a you know, persnickety academic and really, you know, just try to understand um, people who are using this language and 
their um, political struggle on their own terms. Sure. So connecti connecting with that very large population of prisoners mm -hmm. has been part of uh, a long struggle for left academics and left activists. Mm -hmm. uh, is that yeah. changing, do you think? Um, uh, are people more or less concerned with the mm. prison population? Mm. And, and, is, and, is the, and is the prison population itself you know, better educated and more capable of yeah. this overthrowing is a, the system? Yeah, this say. is a great question because um, it's interesting because I was um, kind of raised in the anarchist milieu and um, certainly there has always been an emphasis on doing prisoner support work. So. Mm. Um, various um, organizations like um, Books Through Bars, uh, Anarchist Black Cross um, have um, put a lot of labor into staying connected to people in prison and sending prisoners books and literature that they want to read. And that was always part of the, the political culture and um, certainly, um, you know, um, on the left, there's also Angela Davis um, mm. and um, many Marxists like Ruthie Gilmore, who have been foundational f figures for the prison abolitionist movement. And so, they're, what they're trying to do is connect, um, you know, their investment in communist and socialist politics to their investment in abolishing prisons by talking about the need for things like universal health care, um, education, um, housing, and all of these things that um, they, you know, see as, as integral parts of their um, politics. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, that's been um, definitely um, part of the, you know, black Marxist tradition for many decades. Sure. And so I'm even thinking about the Black Panthers and people like George Jackson, um, who were writing before um, mass incarceration really exploded in the U.S., um, but in some ways were laying the groundwork for how to think about the prison system and its role in capitalist society. And so I actually think that now, um, I think it's become even more of an issue that people care about. Um, and for me, it's like there, one concern I have is that some of the work that people have been doing for decades is being erased um, by, you know, people, um, you know, like even Michelle Alexander didn't really acknowledge like the work of the um, people who have been struggling around these issues for a while, like, you know, Angela Davis's work, for example. Um, so for me, it's important to um, keep that memory alive as well of this history and tradition of organizing around prisons. Sure, and it's, it's important to the Marxist tradition to be historically minded. Yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> not to pretend that you're reinventing something when the struggle's been well and truly put in place right. <laughs> before you. Uh, important part of media studies and cultural studies, especially in the radical traditions that inform some of the work there. I wanted to transition a little bit, but still connect to uh, the struggle against uh, massive injustice uh, in the U.S. prison uh, industrial complex, mm -hmm. and seeing that as a purely a manifestation of contemporary capitalism. Mm -hmm. Then to sort of flip it a little bit, but go deeper into the contradiction and think about the role of new technology, uh -huh, right. and how if we think about Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement or some other movements. Mm -hmm that have been fundamentally progressive recently, they've been about working out how to use technology mm -hmm. to overthrow things that have just been allowed to sit around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in your work? Where does technology fit? I know you've done some work yeah. on neural rhythms and so on, mm -hmm. so we talk about that briefly. Yeah, for sure. It's a huge topic and something that I think about a lot, um, especially related to my current research on the history of risk assessment. and the use of algorithms in criminal justice. Um, for me, what I was trying to do in the book is um, think about how changes in technology shape what is politically possible. And so a lot of people are like, oh, well, we shouldn't, um, you know, either there's this kind of um, celebration of technology and its um, 
emancipatory potential or, um, you know, kind of techno pessimism or technophobia, like rejection of technology, which, you know, is valid because p there are a lot of people who are concerned with security culture and being mm -hmm. monitored and surveilled. Um, but what I, for me, it was really important to understand how new developments in technology can um, foreclose or open certain political possibilities. So even thinking about um, prisoner organizing in technology. Um, when we were driving over here to the studio, we were talking about voice surveillance and the fact that um, many states are creating these enormous databases of prisoner voice prints. And so they'll have prisoner, they'll record prisoners' voices without asking for their consent. Mm. And uh, apparently they're doing this with people who are calling prisoners as well, um, and then creating these databases of prisoner voice prints and then trying to use that to monitor prisoner calls. So if someone tries to use like the number of another prisoner, they'll be able to algorithmically determine when there's been a mismatch or something like that. And so this has raised a lot of concerns in terms of prisoner organizing, so people on the outside calling multiple prisoners, they might be flagged as someone who's suspicious because, you know, what are they doing calling so yeah. many prisoners? But then what you also see happening um, is the influx of contraband cell phones into prisons and prisoners using co um, contraband technology as a way to do organizing right. as well. And so there are all these paradoxes that you find um, because they're trying to figure out how to police and shut down that as well by experimenting with you know technology to block cell phone reception and things like that. Um, but you see um, different um, you know, ways in which technology is being wielded, um, particularly by the state to control and manage and surveil people, and then people trying to find ways around those mm. controls. Um, and so for me, it, it was also important to, to um, analyze some of these predictive policing technologies, because this is something that um, is invisible to us, um, but has a profound effect on how um, people just, you know, move through the world. Um, and so some of these um, t tools are being used to um, generate heat lists or send um, police officers to different neighborhoods to be police using um, crime data to figure out where to send people. So we're, we're in that situation where technology has a uh a huge downside, mm -hmm. as you might say, for what it makes possible mm -hmm. for those who are in the state or uh, who are you know, concerned with that. And then there's uh, other folk who, uh, within the prison system but elsewhere in society, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, for example, right, yeah. able to organise things mm -hmm. and organise accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like our, our time is up. Oh, so, uh, Jackie, yes, thank <laughs> you so much for being here. Yeah, thank and for you your for contribution. It's been a great conversation. And until next time, this is Marcus Breen, Boston Media Theory, saying thanks and keep on mediating. <laughs>